we was looking forward to getting electricity. Remember when REA went by and I was 10 years old, but I can remember better than I can remember stuff that did yesterday. Mr. Wilson and his crew come by and dug the holes by hand and set the poles more or less by hand. One Sunday morning I'd had my Saturday night bath and my dad was down at the corner talking to a neighbor and, and I took a stick down in that big hole that Mr. Wilson had dug and uh, I thought, well, I can get in that hole and get right out of it because there's a fence beside it. So I slid down in there and I didn't realize the mud was a foot and a half deep and there's frogs in the hole. I had to take a bath twice that week. <laughs> Mr. O.J. Otten was our neighbor and uh, he and my dad, Walter Good, went around talking to people, trying to get them to sign up. People didn't think there was any way they could use, I don't remember how many watts it was, but it was three dollars and a quarter, uh, maybe 40 watts. There was no way they could use 40 watts of electricity. And now we use like more than that before we get out of bed, probably. My father was one of the uh, original directors and the founder of this uh, co-op of course, we remember the uh, efforts that were made to enlist people to have a membership. Five dollars. Five dollars was an awful lot of money in that day and age. And of course, uh, what was the assurance that you're going to get something for that? And so that was the push to get people to enroll, to become members. The Rural Electrification Act was signed on May 11, 1935 by FDR. And it's amazing that this act was going to actually enable rural people to have the same things as their city counterparts. This was a um, government program that came in and loaned money. And these were loans, they had to be repaid. But these were loans that allowed these co-ops to come in and do something that the private utilities were refusing to do. And so the farmer said, well, let's go together and we will form a cooperative and we will build our own electrical units and we will then be able to furnish power to homes in the rural areas. And so they were able to go together and get management and get teams together that would be able to hire contractors uh, to build these lines and then set up substations that we could buy power then from these utilities who had refused to sell us power as an individual customer would sell us more than willingly to sell us then power through a substation then to furnish power to energize the lines out in the country. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you this. The greatest thing on earth is to have the love of God in your heart, and the next greatest thing is to have electricity in your house. This was a farmer who was giving testimony at a rural church in Tennessee in the 1940s. This comment sums up what the early founders uh, felt when electricity was part of their life. When the organization began, they began to dig holes, began to put up wire, poles, uh, they began to see the, that we were going to have electricity, we are going to have the conveniences of our city cousins. So we were waiting then for it to come energize then the wiring in the house with the power from the co-op. And so with eager anticipation, we watched that uh, bulb come on, and then we had power. When the power first came on that day in February, one gentleman in the area said, well, it's just like town around here. So in other words, uh, all the work that my dad had done and the other directors had done, uh, we was beginning to show fruit. We had to get ready for electricity, and nobody in my family knew anything about electricity. So we had my uncle who had electricity, and then my cousin did our wiring. And they, we just had the attic and they had a, you know, a little crawl space to get up there. And I remember what a time they had, because it didn't have any flooring or anything, they just had to step on the two by fours. And, and one time, Glenn, my cousin, stuck his foot through, but it was in the pantry area, so it wasn't too bad, but it was kind of funny, so we always, talked about when Glenn fell through the fell through the ceiling. And I was probably the seventh or eighth grade. I was out at the outhouse one night and as I came out of that door I could see a light in the house. And it wasn't, you know, the coal oil light, it was a light. <laughs> and it was in the bedroom and nobody would have been in the bedroom at that hour of the night, you know, so it was supper time. I remember how excited we all were. Everybody called everybody if you didn't have a light turned on, you might not, like us, you might not know the power was on, the power is on. 
thinking back on some of the developments, I, I thought that probably one of the things my mother probably appreciated more than anything was when we got on an electric stove. Because I do recall when I was small that we had a, a cook stove in the kitchen. That was, of course, before air conditioning, and it was pretty hot in the summertime when you had a cook stove going trying to prepare a meal. I was looking very forward to getting electricity because at that time I was in the high school and you had to come right home from school, get your homework done because lights, even if you had Aladdin lamp, which was the top of the line, it would not put out that much light like a light bulb would. With the power coming, uh, that brought refrigeration and the co-op went into uh, a major appliance sales and because they were selling freezers, uh, refrigerators, uh, items so that were uh, making it easier for the farmer and the farmer's wife in their daily life. Our first uh, appliance that we had was an electric skillet and my parents had gone to an annual meeting and they had drawings and my parents won an electric skillet. So that was quite a thing. So, of course, the recipe book come with that, and I learned to make pineapple upside down cakes with electric skillet. I was born and raised on the farm. Electric was so much more convenient. I can remember having to go out to, we call it the smokehouse, and I had to start the motor and charge the battery during the day. That was my job, and my brothers, then could listen to the radio of the night. So you can imagine when we could just plug it in, what a great improvement there was. One of the greater of things was like a vacuum. You can't believe house cleaning. You know, you took your rugs out and you put them on the clothesline and you beat them with a beater. And now can you imagine? You know, I mean, electric did everything. I know in the summer we got a refrigerator and that was wonderful. We could have iced tea and lemonade like people in town did. We had a ice box. The ice man delivered a big chunk of ice about one to two times a week. And uh, also occasionally we would store our butter in the well on a rope to keep it cool. We were really thrilled to have the refrigerator, opening the door and see the light, and uh, it was very handy. I was very happy to see uh, my parents convert from a hand crank cream separator to an electric separator because it was always my job to turn the, the uh, hand cranked cream separator. So that was a great improvement on the farm also. One of the main things that was of uh, great use for the farmers was the advent of electric arc welders, where we could work with steel as easily as we could work with wood. And so those were one of the first things that became a useful accessory for the farmer in his uh, quest to make things a little bit easier for the farming life. When we first got electricity, everyone just had one pole light, and uh, that was sufficient. Nobody had two or they didn't have one at the barn. Later on, we did get lights in the barn. We had some cattle, but we built them by hand. When we got electricity, the first thing the folks did was they, they bought a, an air compressor to run milking machines. And then they put a, a light bulb in out there so they didn't have to use the lantern. And that worked so well in a short period of time. They came back and wired, they ran the electricity to the houses and they put a light bulb in each kitchen. And that was so great that then very shortly they put a light bulb in the ceiling of, of where we ate. <laughs> there was no heat in the upstairs of the houses. And we used to put bricks on the old warm morning black stoves to heat them up and wrap them in towels or paper and take them up and put them in bed. And they'd keep your feet warm to, while you were going to sleep. And then uh, when we got electricity, then after the war, uh, we could take space heaters up. Then you didn't have to be in such a rush getting out of bed and into your clothes. Uh, <laughs> when it was below freezing, it didn't take you long to get dressed. Then the next thing, and I think that was in 48, we expanded the water system and got indoor plumbing. 
Up until that time, we had a 55-gallon drum out on the roof of this metal building, and that was the water for our shower. And from early April, it was kind of cool, and then after October, it was pretty cool taking a shower. Or you had your choice of putting the boiler on the stove inside and carrying water out on the back porch and your wash tub. And then, so you took a bath every Saturday night, whether you needed it or not. And uh, so when we got the indoor plumbing, well, then we also had a shower. We had a water heater, electric water heater. Boy, that was, a, we were really uptown then. Those are the things I remember the most. I was a small lad and many times going to the office over in Di Vernon, which was about a block east of the square, uh, we became acquainted with the manager, Mr. Charles Masters. This was the beginning and, and he had a large charge, a uh, large responsibility in getting this thing off the ground and going. Uh, this was a, quite a responsibility for somebody to be manager of a cooperative in its infant stages. The uh, business manager was Manfred White. Chief lineman was Bud Wilson, a uh, big burly fellow. They had two other linemen. I remember one of them was a little skinny fellow. They called him Skinny Dawson. And the two were uh, inseparable as uh, teamwork out on the lines. You dug, holes, you dug the holes by hand. The linemen were out there and the groundmen were out there with uh, digging, with digging equipment, with shovels and spoons and uh, digging, digging the holes by hand. To get the poles into the ground, they really used pipe cat hooks and pipe poles to get the thing elevated and then use pipe poles to raise the pole and set it in the ground. At the very beginning there were no two-way radios and there were certain members that the linemen would stop and telephone in and tell them and ask them for if they needed anything or what they were doing and they would ask for instructions from the office. Had one telephone in the in the office and the, and they called in. Then later on, we had two-way radios, which was quite an advancement. The most enjoyable thing about working for the co-op, I was so happy that they put electricity to the farm homes, which they needed so badly. My heart has always been in the co-op. I, I can't forget the years I spent there. Charlie Masters was my first boss. He really organized it, as I remember. I think he was more interested in the work outside than the office because he knew the office would be taken care of. We all worked in one large room. We got along very well. The monthly bill was three and a quarter, and we didn't use much because we didn't have much appliances to use it on, just lights and uh, very cheap. And I'm sure it was a hardship for some people. But then on the other hand, the people that really wanted electricity were more than happy to pay that. The lighting was so great. And then appliances came slowly because those were times when people didn't have very much money. And uh, first you bought an iron and then a refrigerator and vacuum cleaner and so on and so forth. They moved in Di Vernon from a location to the uh, east of the square, about a block and a half, to on the square. And then I think they uh, outgrew this facility. They also needed warehouse space. And so when this became available, this area that was on the outskirts of uh, Auburn, they uh, bought this area and then they built not only a headquarters here, but they put their warehouse here. And the manager even built a home in the subdivision that's behind it. So the uh, Co-op then had a base of operation. Not only was the manager here, the business of the uh, building was here, and the warehouse, and they also had a uh, pole yard and a place that they could store their equipment. Uh, before that, it was scattered through various buildings, and here they have a centralized storage area, a centralized garage, and so it, it was, uh, I think, a good move, and I think people appreciated the move. And I can tell you some of the stories that we had about a lady that came into the office one day after we had moved in and she looked around and she was uh, just a little upset. She said to me, I wanna know where you got the money to build this place. And why I ever thought of it, I said the same place we got the money to put the electricity to your house. She didn't say a word. After we moved over to Auburn, we sold appliances. 
refrigerators, air conditioners. Also, we sell light bulbs. I became a manager of Rural Electric Convenience in 1968. At that time, I, the uh, thing that was very important was upgrading the lines and building the system up, building new substations, and uh, making power available because of ever-increasing demand of power at that time. And also at that time, we were also a member of Western Illinois Power Cooperative, which was a GNT generation and transmission cooperative uh, based in Jacksonville. The co-op meetings, some of them, when they moved here to Auburn, where they had a grassy area, would set up a tent and these would be a three-day situation. They would have a large meeting on the first night, and then it would be an all-day meeting the next day, and then it would go into the evening, and then it would be into the, next, the third day. And there would be all kinds of exhibits. There would be those exhibitors who would come uh, selling their wares, appliances. So everyone was trying to promote uh, their products, and they had beauty pageants, they had talent shows, they had entertainment. These were big events. And I think they used the tent and the meetings that were held to help reinforce to the people they're here, and this is the reason why we're here. Yes, we can't forget the beauty contests that were held in the tents, and we had beauty contests for several years, and, uh, and that was a, a drawing card to get members in, and it was a good thing, a good, a good activity. In 1964, uh, my parents encouraged me to, to enter into the contest for the Queen Contest. And uh, I did, and I was chosen as a runner-up, but then in 1965, I was chosen as Miss Rural Electric Convenience Cooperative, an honor that for me to represent my cooperative in that manner. It has been in our family many years to be very active in the cooperative, starting with my grandfather as being one of the men who worked founding it and so it was definitely a strong part of our family and, and we were very happy to have the cooperative. Over the years of my public career, no other domestic activity has been closer to my heart than the program which has lighted the homes and the lives of rural America. And that's our program of rural electric cooperatives. The RECC has furnished them to these young people in high schools an opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. and see how government works. And I think that the close relationship with the co-op and the fact that our legislatures are, must be informed of the necessity of having a good relationship between the government and the co-op, the uh, youngsters have to learn that. And I think this is an opportunity to find a grassroots of how a government works and how to, uh, the lobbying works to uh, get the point across that we need this help for these co-ops and that's why our legislatures need to be uh, informed and getting them to know that this is the pact that we need to teach these kids that this is how the government works in the United States. It's a, a government of the people and by the people and for the people. I started at the co-op in October of 1972. I worked at the co-op my junior and senior year during the summer. There were 12 full-time journeyman linemen and two apprentices, Troy Wise and myself. After four years, we became journeyman linemen. I was fortunate enough when I started that I had 12 full-time journeyman linemen who had between 15 and 20 years experience already. I was just fortunate enough to be able to work with these gentlemen and learn what I did to excel in my job. We were all in hooks. All we had were service trucks, pickup trucks, and we had an A-frame boom and one digger truck. Within a few years, we picked up a second digger truck. We didn't pick up a bucket truck until probably 1975, 1976. In 1978, we got our first construction bucket truck, which was the year that we had our major ice storm in uh, Good Friday of 1978. Early in the morning, my telephone rang and the answering service said, Sir, 
The lines are the calls are coming in so fast we can't handle them. We need to get some help at the office. I went outside and looked, and their ice was all over everything. I immediately left, and that was the last time I was home for a while because the lines all started coming down, and we had damage in all five counties. And I think at one time when there was no electricity any place. Well, they repaired as much as they could with what they had because they were trying to get power back to as many people as they could in the shortest period of time. And so therefore, uh, the uh, lines were put up. Uh, not all the lines were able to stay up. Many of them, they had temporary splices and so forth. So these were always letting go. And so you would be without power for a few hours every once in a while because the line would, would break because the splice did not hold. And so it took many years before things were really put back into original condition. Well, at that time, we uh, had all overhead lines and it was determined that underground lines would be a thing that would not be damaged by wind, ice, storms, tornadoes. So we endeavored to put as many of the lines underground. One of the things that we started to do was to get these substations tied together with underground lines so that we could switch from one substation to another in place of failure. And we had that accomplished in, in many areas throughout the cooperative territory. Since 2004, Rural Electric Convenience has installed the automatic meter reading system on our co-op lines, which makes beneficial for the co-op in being able to get meter reads, letting the consumer be able to see how many kilowatts they are using during the day, during the hour. When they have questions about high bills, they can look at their own accounts and get some of the answers that beforehand we weren't able to give them except on a monthly basis. As we look to the future, we need to find some way of producing electricity. We see uh, wind farms around us. We have a wind generator here locally, and we see it. We can see it from our farm turning. And so we're trusting that it's printing out power that's going into the lines that feed to our house. I also think solar power may come in there. The only real problem with some of these things is that it is not a constant power. And I think we need to look into some type of uh, power that can be generated by a renewable source. What this may be, I don't know. That's going to be those who are of a scientific bent to find that, to develop it. I think we need to learn to be more conserving, to buy appliances that are efficient in their use of electricity. I think that if we can be careful, uh, we can not only reduce the amount of electricity we use, we can use it more effectively. Well, my whole life when I was growing up, I knew I wanted to be part of the cooperative movement. And so in 1983, I started work at Adams Electric Cooperative in Camp Point. And then in 1999, I was fortunate enough to be named President and CEO of Rural Electric. I, I really like this cooperative. We have great employees. We have a great tradition. And uh, we have members who appreciate what we do out there every day, providing reliable electric service at cost. And the good thing is, People can still walk into Rural Electric and talk to the CEO or talk to anybody they want to if they have a problem. They don't have to sit and wait on some uh, 800 phone line hoping they'll get somebody to uh, take their call or help them out. And that's why I like being part of Rural Electric. I like to serve people. I like the aspect that our employees care about what we do. And uh, I think a lot of that stems from our tradition which started with a group of farmers who wanted electricity when they organized. And of course, the following year in 1937, our first substation was energized. <laughs>